The following podcast is brought to you by the Bridge Bible Church. For more information, please visit us online at thebridgewire.com. Good morning. My name is Kevin Mitchell. I'm an elder and associate pastor here at the Bridge Bible Church. Thank you for joining us and welcome. If this is your first time visiting with us, we would like to challenge you to our six-week challenge. It's fairly simple. We just ask that you would show up for six different Sundays to get a feel for who we are and what we're about. We'd also have some um, next step cards, as Taylor was speaking about, outside at our Get Connected table out in the lobby. If you would like some more information about the bridge, you can fill one of those out. And then also it gives us a chance to uh, get to know a little bit more about you and then find out how we can serve you also. So today's message is on suffering and rejoicing to gain intimacy with God. So the goal of this message is to help us learn how to gain Christ in the midst of suffering. So my hope is that this message is going to be used to equip you and to encourage you because we will suffer and we need to gain Christ in the midst of that suffering. So my also hope is that you leave here with kingdom motives and a kingdom mindset. So I decided on this message because I wanted to know for myself what the Bible said about suffering, what God reveals himself through suffering, and then how do we respond as Christians? And then for those that do not know Christ, let them know that there's a better way to suffer and to go through pain. So this can be a challenging message for for me to deliver and then for you to hear. So I would just ask that you would please pray with me. Father, We humbly come before you today asking for your mercy and your grace and your love. Lord, we are broken people looking for that, just that, your love, your forgiveness, and your guidance. Father, we ask that you would help us to die to self, that our focus would be on glorifying and pleasing you. We ask for your desires, your thoughts, and your actions, for we know that your heart and your motives And your actions are pure and holy. And we ask for a heart that loves like yours. I praise you for the ministries you have here at this bridge. I praise you for the leaders, the volunteers, the staff, and the elders that you have called to the bridge. I also praise you for the visitors that you have brought through these doors. It's not a mistake that they are here today. You have directed them here. Lord, guide my words and allow me to be your mouthpiece this morning. I pray that we are encouraged and strengthened by your words and truth. Please transform our hearts. I praise and worship you, and I pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. So it's important to start from the beginning to see how this all started. Suffering traces back to the sin of Adam, which corrupted our whole world and the world which we live. So because of Adam's sin against God, In the garden, all the people will now know what it looks like to live in a world of profound pain. Every person will experience the pain of living in a world of brokenness. And if you have not suffered yet, you will. That is promised in the Bible. So many of us think of death and dying when it comes to suffering. But we must be prepared for the diversity of struggles that we will face in this life. God's perspective is on our pain is the one that conforms us to the reality of the struggles that we will face. And God's perspective is the one that actually stands the test when people come looking for answers, solutions, and help. God's word not only describes the difficulties we will have, but it also addresses them and how we will get through them. So, living in a sinful world brings pain. Whether we suffer because of our own sin, the sin of others, the pain of others, the sins of the world, the operations of Satan, or just our decline of our, our, of our bodies towards death, we suffer. And then when we face trials of various kinds, we need to trust that these trials occur underneath the sovereignty of a good and powerful God who will never do anything to his people that is not for their ultimate good. Now that statement that I just said is biblical, And it is true, and it's worth saying one more time. When we face trials of various kinds, we need to trust that these trials occur underneath the sovereignty of a good and powerful God 
who will never do anything to us that is not ultimately for our ultimate good. But this statement is the very thing that brings a lot of people trouble because they don't know what it looks like to experience pain with a good God. So if we do not trust that the God of the Bible reveals himself as being good, then who do we trust? If God does not allow us to suffer, then who will we depend on? So when I was going through biblical counseling classes, one of uh, the instructors had said a statement that has stuck with me for, for some time now. He said that uh, hard is not bad, it is just hard. It's a great statement, right? Hard is not bad, it's just hard. It's all in the perspective. It's all in how we look at things. But God will use it for good. So I kept that statement in mind while I was preparing this message. I was really, spent some time in the Bible. I was reading books and articles by Paul Tripp and, and uh, Heath Lambert and Piper, just trying to find some answers to a couple of my questions that I had. So a couple of those questions, the two that I was looking for was, uh, why do we suffer? So I was kind of curious as, why do we do that? And then, how should we suffer? And so this is what I found through the readings. Why do we suffer? We suffer to gain intimacy with God. That's what God allows us to be here for. And then how should we suffer? Well, we suffer by trusting God, dying to self, and then having a servant's heart. That's how we should suffer. Christ is that example to us. And he is the perfect example. So if we're to gain intimacy with God, then we must trust God, we must die to self, and we must have a servant's heart. So Christ represented us on the cross, and now he's asking us to represent him on earth. So he is the one that came, and so now we have to be his ambassadors. We have to follow his examples, the examples that are commanded of us to love others. So we need to be humble and desperate for Christ and the Spirit to guide us through our suffering and pain. So in the first thing that they told us in biblical counseling training, first class out, was that if we were to counsel people with our own opinion, we would screw it up. He's right. He's absolutely right. I'm glad he said that. It was such a huge relief to me. I have no good opinions. I have no good original thoughts. They're always from reading somebody else's. But he also said he followed it with, we must take them to the Bible. That's where the truth is. That's where the answers are. Take them to the Bible. So this morning will be no different. I'm going to spend a lot of time in Scripture, um, and it will be God's Word that we listen to and not our own. So if you would, please grab a Bible. If you don't have one, please grab a Bible from in front of you in the, the bottom of the chair. So we'll be looking at a few sections of Scripture. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 22. And that will be on page 828 if you have one of the Bibles that we have provided. So then I'm just going to ask, too, that you keep them out, because this morning we're going to be looking at a few books of the Bible. So an example of gaining intimacy with God by trusting God, dying to self, and having a servant's heart is going to be shown in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. So verse 37 and Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So who is the focus on in these verses? Verse 37 tells us to love God with everything that we have. And then verse 39 tells us to love others. The focus needs to be on others. To die to self is to set aside what we want in this moment and focus instead on loving God with everything that we have and loving others just as much as we love ourselves. And we all know how much we love ourselves, right? So God's calling us to love others just as much as we love ourselves. So this moves us away from self-centeredness and moves us closer to a deeper relationship with God and becoming open-hearted followers of Christ that care deeply for others. 
It's much easier to pay attention to the concerns, interests, and needs of others when our own interests don't consume us. So in dying to self, we find a genuine life depending on Christ. And we're able to tr trust Christ completely and precisely because of who he is and what he does. He is a loving God. He then asked us to obey him by loving others. And the good way to love others is by serving them. So suffering benefits us. In a world where humanity has rebelled against God, he uses those actions and overrules the evil intentions of sinners to accomplish good. So Romans 8.28 has brought comfort to untold numbers of God's people. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So the straightforward meaning of this is that God will use suffering of his people to produce good in their lives. Now it can be hard for us to understand how God would use pain for our good, but just as a skilled surgeon uses a knife, a surgical knife, to cut us for us, our benefit, we have to trust God will use pain and suffering for our good also. And we also know when that skilled surgeon cuts us for our benefit, he uses that scalpel, that there will be pain involved. But we also know that there's time of recovery. And we can trust that God, through that pain and through that recovery, he will be with us and he will comfort us through those moments. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the promises made in the Bible that we will suffer as God's people. So we are focusing on the need to prepare for suffering. So the reason for this is the Bible promises that God's people will suffer. And we are all God's people. No one will be immune from this. So I'm going to be speaking about a few verses. They'll be behind me on the screen. I'm going to go through quite a few of them, so don't expect you to keep up. So we'll start with Acts 14, verse 22. The verse says that Paul told all of his young churches this, Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom. And then Jesus said in John 15, 20, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And then Peter said in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, it's not strange. It's expected. So let's look at a few more. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 3, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And promised again in 2 Timothy 3, 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So Acts tells us we'll have tribulations. In John, Jesus promises persecution. And then Peter tells us we'll have trials that will test, or test our faith. So I take it to be biblical truth that the more serious we become about being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, the more we will suffer. The more serious we are at exposing the works of darkness... The, sins and, or the bonds of sin and Satan, loosening those, the more we will suffer. So that's why we should prepare to suffer. And God helps us for suffering by teaching us and showing us that we can suffer well and we are meant to go deeper in our relationship with Christ through those sufferings. You get to know him better when you share in his sufferings. So the people that who, who write most deeply and sweetly about the preciousness of Christ are the people that are in the Bible that who have suffered most deeply with him. So we're going to look at a few examples of, his, of these words in Job, Stephen, and Peter. So let's start with Job. So after months of suffering, Job finally says to God in Job 42.5, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. So Job had been a godly and upright man, pleasing to God in every way. But the difference between what he knew of God through prosperity and now what he knows of God through the adversity of it is the difference between him hearing about God and now seeing God. And we need to look to God when we suffer. We cannot look to ourselves. God is our ultimate guide and comforter. So then when Stephen was arrested... 
and put on trial for his faith, he was allowed a, a chance to preach. So the outcome of this is that the religious leaders were enraged by this, and they, they uh, ground their teeth at him. So they were just about to drag him out of the city and kill him, and just at that moment, Luke 7, 55 tells us that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit and gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So there is a special revelation, a special intimacy that's prepared for those who suffer with Christ. And I want that special intimacy, and I hope, for, I hope that for you as well. So another example is when Paul tells us of his life in Philippians 3. So if you would, could you please turn to Philippians 3. It will be on page 981 if you have one of the black Bibles. So we will start on verse 4. So Philippians 3, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 14. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might or I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So the focus of today's message is the intimacy factor in suffering. So one of the purposes of the suffering for Christians is their relationship with God will become less formal, less artificial, and less distant, and really become more real, more intimate, and more personal. So here are the four observations from that text. First, Paul's aim in all of this, namely, is to gain Christ, to know him, and to be in him, and I, to have fellowship with Christ that has more intimacy. Second, we see trust in God in verse 9. So the righteous, this, that depends on faith. We must have faith and we must trust God. Third, Paul's preparation is to suffer by reversing his values. And this is done by dying to self. We see in verse 8 where he says, I have suffered the loss of all things. Count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. If we're going to prepare to suffer, we need to die to self and look for Christ, or look to Christ for the answers. So fourth, we see the servant's heart. Verse 14 tells us, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul will do everything he can to represent Christ on this earth. He knows that he's Christ's ambassador, and he wants to be the light of this world like Christ was. And Paul has a calling, and he will strain forward to what lies ahead. The important part there that I read was the strain. Straining in life. It's not going to be easy. If you're following Christ, it is a rocky road, but it's worth it. So we must learn to love and serve others as Christ did for us and continues to do today. So the final set of verses we'll look at will be in 1 Peter chapter 4. So 1 Peter chapter 4 is on page 1016. So remember, we are called to suffer and rejoice to gain intimacy with Christ. So starting with verse 1, Peter puts it this way. Since therefore... 
Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless adultery. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the people the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. So we'll stop here for a moment. Verse 2 and 3 ask us to put off our old self, to die to self. In counseling, I have everybody memorize two verses. There's many more, but I always start with two of them. So the first one is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. And then followed by 2 Corinthians 5, 9. That says, so whether you're home or away, make it your aim to please him. So we were put on this earth to glorify God and to please him. That's exactly why we're here. So look back at verse 2. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. We were put on this earth to please and glorify God always looking to do his will. So we must remember to love God and to love others always. So we're going to skip verses 7 through 11 just for a moment. We'll come back to them, but let's jump down to verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So let's look at a couple verses. I'll pull out verse 14. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the Spirit of God and the Spirit of glory rest upon you. So in other words, God reserves a special coming and resting of His Spirit and His glory on His children who suffer and have pain in His name. We can have comfort in knowing that the Spirit and glory are coming and resting on us when we go through pain and suffering. So then verse 19 says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So verse 19, it's a tough one for me. The last three words speak to a servant's heart. I have read this chapter many times before, and for some reason this last time it just stuck out to me like a light. Our Creator asks us to suffer while doing good. So God doesn't leave us guessing here. He tells us in verses 7 through 11 on how we are supposed to be good and to do good. So let's go back to verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins... Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified 
through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Love covers a multitude of sin. Christ is a perfect example of this. He was asking God to forgive those that were causing him pain and suffering. He started that off when they put him on trial. God loved them through that. God loved them through that when he was pain. He had a bunch of pain through all the beatings. God even loved them as they mocked and spit on him. And then God loved them as he was crucified. He loved them from the start until the very end. He was always asking God to forgive them for they know not what they do. He continues to love us the same way. And he wants us to obey his ways and to do the same thing that he did. So as we're being persecuted, as we have pain, as we're suffering, he calls us and he commands us to love others the same way that he loved them. And I know that's tough. I know that's tough. But it's what he commands of us. So we see a servant's heart in 9 and verse 10. Verse 9 tells us to show hospitality without grumbling. And I've got to admit that I'm getting better at this. I was not always so great at it. I always would enjoy when people would come over and always got great stuff out of it. Um, but God's working on me and I'm getting better at really being excited for people to come over um, because I always find so much uh, just greatness and good that comes from having people over. And I'm getting there. God will continue to work on me. And then verse 10 states to serve one another. So love God, love others. So we will suffer, and we know the purpose is to gain intimacy with God. So God will take us to some pretty low places to get our attention. So uh, let's think about some of the Old Testament ones. So let's think about when God took his people out of Egypt. Where did they take them to? The desert, right? The desert. So his people did not trust him, did not trust God, so they rebelled against him, and so he had to take them to a place where there was nothing but him and no distractions, absolutely desolate. So that way they could become totally dependent on him. It's not a coincidence that, they took him, that God took them to a desert. He did it by design because he knew there was nothing there. So the very basics, even of food and water, they had to rely on God for those to get them by. So God had to take them to a very low place to get their attention. So another example of gaining intimacy with Christ or God, I should say, in this book of Jonah, is God asked Jonah to go to a city and ask them to repent of their evil ways. So God tested Jonah's faith in that moment. And Jonah thought, like, he would suffer, or be persecuted, and probably die. And so instead of trusting in God, a sovereign God that is powerful and good and will use all of that, ultimately for his good, he hightailed it the other direction, Right? Jumps on that boat, gets in the bottom of it, and just goes. So what does God do? God has him swallowed by a great fish. And he kept him there for three days and three nights. So if you were in a fish, who would you depend on? I don't care who's on the top of the boat. If you're in the fish, there's only one person you're crying out to. I can pretty much guarantee that. I know I would. Is God. We have to depend on God. But Jonah did confess, he did repent, and he did learn that through trusting God that there was an intimacy that was gained through that moment. And then that he could really trust God with the rest of his journey. And because of this, the city did repent. Jonah gained intimacy, and God was greatly glorified. But God had to take him to a low place for him to hear and see God without any distractions. So we need to embrace the path of suffering in obedience to God's instructions. We need to lose our life, let go of yourself and your expectations, and trust God to meet you, redeem your story, and give you a place of much greater importance in his bigger story. So as you lose the right to your story, you'll emerge in a much greater one and what you will find is that it will be worth it. So I'm going to land today where we started. So we're going to suffer and rejoice to gain intimacy with God. And we gain intimacy with God 
by trusting God, by dying to ourselves, and having a servant's heart. Go out there and love God and love others. Thank you for listening. To find out more about the Bridge Bible Church or listen to previous podcasts, please visit thebridgewire.com. Thank you.